Hello friends and welcome back. My name is Ashley. I am a mom of two little girls. I have a five-year-old named Kylie and I also have a three-year-old named Mia. And for today's video, I wanted to just sit and talk a little bit with you guys about some things that have been on my mind lately because it is the brand new start of a new year. It is 2023. I have been reflecting a lot on what I would hope this year will look like for our family. I've set some personal goals for myself. And in thinking about all of these things, I've realized that a lot of them are really reflective of the answer to a question that I have been asked time and again on this YouTube channel that I've never actually sat down and answered up until now, because up until this point, I felt like I didn't really have enough information to give you guys, to give you like a really solid answer that I felt good about. But that has changed. I have been reflecting a lot on this question. And the question is, what does Montessori look like at home with older children? So we're talking like beyond the baby and toddler and like early preschool years. Once your child inches closer to that second plane of development, which is ages six to 12, how does Montessori at home look in action, in practice? Is it different than what we were doing from zero to six? And so, because my children are getting closer to that time frame, you know, I have a five-year-old who is about to be six in March. Um, I've actually already started to see some of these changes happening and it's been really exciting. And so I wanted to share this with you guys because I know you've been asking about it and I know many of you have children who are similar in age or slightly younger than mine. So I thought maybe this could give you like a little sneak peek into what's on the horizon. So. From one busy parent to another, today I would like to chat all about Montessori at home with older kids. Wow, I did that intro more times than I will be willing to admit. I'm so glad I finally said it the way I wanted to say it. Let's go ahead and dive into the video. Now, as I mentioned, I have already started to see some of these little changes that have started happening very gradually, just over the last couple of months. It's like little things here and there that I'm noticing that are different about the way that my older daughter really thinks about the world and the way she interacts with other people. She definitely has a much greater sense of empathy for others a greater desire to interact with peers of her own age and a general concern about things outside of her own little bubble, you know, things that are happening in the community and in the world. And it's been so cool to see that. Now, my younger daughter, she will be turning four in March. She's not quite there yet, but she's, you know, two starting to kind of inch closer to this second plane of development as well. And so it's been really fun. It really has. And a lot of the things that we are doing at home and that I foresee us doing at home in the future are exactly the same as they have been for the whole time since they were born. But necessarily, some things are going to change. And so I wanted to give you a little list, I guess, of some of the, the things to really be thinking about if you are a parent of a child who is going into the second plane of development as well, kind of some things to really focus on what really matters the most as a Montessori parent. Because I really feel like there is much less of an emphasis on the physical environment. You know, all the activities and the trays and the shelf setup and the toy rotation. I feel like there's a lot less of that in the second plane than there was in the first plane of development. Because in the first plane of development, you know, their sense of order is so strong and we're really trying to cater to that. And a lot of that is achieved through how we prepare the environment. Now, preparation of the environment is still important in the second plane of development, but they completely lose that internal sense of order. That's not really um, as much of a focus for the child at least anymore. And they start to focus on other things. Like I said, their peers, other people, what's going on in the world. And um, I kind of feel like that's where your parenting kind of needs to shift as well. It kind of follows the child. Not even trying to be corny or cliche, I promise you. I just, I really do think that as parents, when you start to shift toward those years, you have to shift the way you think about your child and their role in the family and the things that you are modeling for them because they are definitely still soaking it all in. I mean, they might not be in that period of the absorbent mind anymore, but they're still learning every single day. And so, yeah, okay. 
let's get to the things that I wanted to share with you. So the first thing has to do with the actual setup of your home. I don't think that there is as much of a need to have you know, like the perfect shelf set up for your child. Certainly you can still have a shelf and you can still have some curated activities that are developmentally appropriate that cater to your child's interests. You can still do that. But I have noticed more and more that as my older daughter grows, she's less interested in sitting down and doing those kinds of things. Like on occasion, she'll go back to them and find something that she's interested in and take it to a table and work on it. But it's not as common. She's much more interested. And I feel like this is just reflective of the stage of development. She's much more interested in doing other things like arts and crafts projects in general. So it's nice to have like an area of your home where they have access to all of their arts and crafts supplies, like a little art atelier. That's what we use our art cart for. Sometimes she really just wants to sit down and build something or do some pretend play, some role playing. And so there's an area of our home where we've got all of the open-ended toys just kind of grouped together now so they've got access to everything that they need when they get into one of those moods. We also have our books all in one location. So if she wants to read, she has a couple of her favorites that are on her little shelf in her bedroom that she will pull out and read sometimes with us, usually at bedtime, but not always. Sometimes it's during the day too. Um, so like there's a reading space, you know, for her with all of the books. What else? Oh, the kitchen. Um, so she's always had all of her utensils and things like that since she was a toddler in one little space in our kitchen. And that has become increasingly important because now, as I'm going to talk about in a little bit, she's more into doing cooking and food prep independently. And so it's nice that she's got a section for all of her things in the kitchen that she knows how to use, that she's able to use. So that's been really useful. So I guess what I'm getting at is that it's more so about like little domains, areas of your home, as opposed to focusing and zeroing in just on the shelf. You really have to start thinking like more globally about what's going on in your whole house and not just in their primary play space. And then the other reason why I feel like there's less of a focus on the shelf is because we also spend a lot of time outside these days. I mean, we've always spent a lot of time outside as a family, but I just feel like there's more of an internal motivation on my older daughter's part to like, hey, I wanna go outside and do X, Y, Z. There's this interest um, in being outside just as much, if not more, as doing things inside the house. And so naturally, there's less of a focus on the things that are on the shelf. And guys, I am all for that because as much time as our children can get outside doing this kind of like unstructured play, exploration, moving their bodies, it is so good for them. If you haven't read the book, um, Last Child in the Woods, then I would highly recommend it because it's, there's a lot of really great information, a lot of good research in there. Something to consider if you're looking for something to add to your reading list. All right, so the next kind of like big category that I wanted to talk about when it comes to Montessori at home in that six to 12 range is that obviously they have greater independence so when they're babies and toddlers, there's a lot of like obsessing over how do I get my child to play independently? Well, I have good news for you. In the six to 12 age group, that comes a lot more naturally. I'm not saying that they do it 100% of the time and they never bother you, that's not the case. But when they do play independently, those urges seem to kind of happen very organically. They're interested in playing independently and just kind of like getting away from what's going on sometimes and slipping into their own world, working on their own projects, reading their own books, you know, doing their own, you know, pretend play just off in a corner somewhere that happens a lot more frequently and they're super interested in it. And so it's been really great to kind of see her getting into that a lot more. Obviously it's been a little bit of a break for me as a parent because sometimes she brings her little sister along with her, depending on what she's doing. But there are some times where she just, you know, sits down and does her own thing. And that has been really cool to see. Now I do want to say that it's not all independent play all the time. This is also balanced out with family togetherness, which is something I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit. So there's a balance between the independent play and doing things together. I also really feel like that six to 12 age group is much more interested in doing arts and crafts projects just on their own. Things that they've thought about and come up with that you're like, where on earth did you come up with that? You know, but having some kind of art supply, open-ended art supplies available for them where they can get to it. They don't have to come and ask you, maybe including some upcycled things that you would have otherwise put in your recycling bin that they can use, but just giving them access to that so that they can get to it whenever they're feeling the creative urge, that has been really helpful. 
You may also start to notice during this stage that they start to develop very specific hobbies, things that they are very intensely interested in. Um, for example, my older daughter has really shown an interest in sewing and learning how to sew, which is something that I introduced in that zero to six age range when she was in you know, like early preschool. And it was just kind of, you know, something that I introduced, you know, here's something that you can learn. And I never had any expectation around it, but she just naturally has shown an interest in sewing. And that is something that I actually incorporated into her Christmas gifts this year. I bought her like a little sewing kit because that was something she talked about wanting for months on end. Um, so I feel like, again, all kids are different. You'll see them develop different interests, but you are going to see some kind of interest or another begin to blossom. And that's something that that you could potentially nurture. Something else that might come up for this age group is a budding interest in potentially exploring an extracurricular activity. Now, I wouldn't go crazy with it. I would maybe have them stick to one activity at a time and really let them get into it, you know, and really explore it as deep as possible before they decide if it's something they want to continue or potentially decide they don't want to continue and they want to explore something different. Um, but that interest is likely to pop up during this time, especially if they see a lot of their friends starting to engage in some of these extracurricular activities, which is my last part of this is that as part of this growing independence, they naturally kind of gravitate to wanting to spend more time with their peers as opposed to just always with the family. So this is where you're going to start to see like, I want my friend to come over. They want to go to their friends' houses. Maybe they start asking to have sleepovers, things like that, um, because that is natural. This is a natural part of development from six to 12. And so, joining an extracurricular activity might be an outlet also for that added social time with peers. All right, so moving on to the next category of things that you can expect as a Montessori parent with older children is that they are capable of taking on an increased amount of responsibility. Now, if you kind of go back to the basics here for a minute, we've been doing practical life activities with our children as Montessori parents since they were babies, right? Toddlers. And they're accustomed to like what the natural, you know, everyday ebb and flow of your family looks like. They know what the house chores are and they've likely been helping out with them in as much as they're able to do given their, you know, developing abilities, how old they are. But at this stage, they really become capable of doing so much more. And it's up to us as parents to recognize that and to kind of stop babying them, I guess. I don't know how to, how to phrase what I'm thinking. It's not that we were ever babying them, but it's like, you know, we recognize that they could only do so much. And sometimes we forget that they've gotten older and that they can do more. And we're kind of afraid to let go a little bit. So if we can tell ourselves like, hey, I think they can probably handle more and I need to like seed some of the control, you know, and allow our child to take on greater responsibility, then they have an opportunity to prove that to us and to themselves. And so things, just to give you an example, um, they can be responsible for lots of little tasks. And this is actually something I guess you could do when they're younger too, but I find it's easier as they get older. Little things every single day, like, hey, can you hold the door for me while I take out the trash or hey can you carry this for me um you know can you go throw this away can you go get this thing that i forgot upstairs like little tasks that are super simple and quick that we would oftentimes think of just doing for ourselves but now our kids can help um and that makes them feel like good about themselves like hey i helped my mom with something i helped out dad with this Thing that he always normally does, but now I get to help him and that's exciting for them. And again, they're just little menial tasks that we probably wouldn't even give a second thought to, but for a child who is learning that they can do things that other people find valuable, that is really cool. And so to involve them as often as you can in these little things each and every day, it goes a long way. And then some other things that you will find your second plane child is much more capable and reliable about doing, maybe not 100% of the time, but more often than not. Um, I actually have a list on my phone so that I don't forget to mention any of them to you guys, but things like setting and clearing the table. They are capable of you just saying, hey, can you go set the table? Dinner's about to be ready. They can go do that. They can be responsible for clearing their plate every single time, or maybe clearing the table for the whole family if it's like, you know, their night to do it. 
um, folding and putting away laundry. I actually put the pile of like folded laundry. Sometimes they'll help me, sometimes not. But I put the pile of folded laundry on my older daughter's bed and she is responsible for putting it away in her dresser by herself. And she's very good at it. She has her own little system, the way she likes it organized. I let go of the control factor there because I know there's a way that I would do it and it's not her way, but that's okay. She does it and she does it her way and that is okay with her. They can also wash the dishes by hand or if you are loading the dishwasher, they can help you with loading the dishwasher or unloading it. Um, and then you can actually show them how to set the settings on the dishwasher and put the soap in and then close it so that it runs. Although I would caution you to double check because one time, actually I think it might've been my younger daughter, not my older one, but one time, we accidentally had the self-clean cycle set, which was like a nine hour cycle, something ridiculous. And my husband heard it running like at night when we were about to go to bed. And he was like, is that the dishwasher running? <laughs> and so now I double check just to make sure the buttons are right before we close it. But it is something that they are absolutely capable of doing. And it's actually one of my girl's favorite like little chores that they do is to load the dishwasher and run it. They are also much better about cleaning up. And I'm not saying like in the moment cleaning up after themselves, because again, that sense of order is just like pff, gone in the six to 12 range. But depending on the child and depending on how much you work with them on this and how much you know it feels like a together activity in the beginning with a slow, gradual release of more responsibility to them, but cleaning up. Um, as a family, we just do like a group cleanup in the evenings after dinner time and before we start bedtime routine. And my older daughter has gotten really good about it. She knows like, this is what we do. It's not even a question. It's just like brushing our teeth or going to the bathroom before we leave the house. It's just what we do. And so after dinner time is over, I, we say, okay, it's time for us to clean up. And she just boop, immediately goes to wherever she decides she wants to start and she starts cleaning up. Um, so again, that's something that you have to work on with them. They're not naturally going to do that because I don't know any kids that naturally love to clean. Maybe there's a few, mine aren't one of them, um, but it's something that they can learn to do. And my battery is about to die. Okay, all right, there we go, fresh battery. As I was saying, uh, something else that I encourage my daughter to do, my older daughter, is to brush her own teeth. Um, not every night because I wanna make sure that she has good dental hygiene and she's not getting cavities and things like that. So what we do is kind of a compromise we reached is that she brushes one night, I brush the next night. She brushes, I brushes, and we just take turns. And I find that that's really helpful because now she's learning to take more responsibility for like, hey, this is something I should be doing um, that mom is not going to do forever. And so she's getting more practice that way and I'm still able to make sure that, you know, her teeth teeth aren't rotting. So um, yeah, brushing their own teeth, something they can do. Grocery shopping. We went grocery shopping today. Our store has the little carts like that are kid size, which is so cool. I love that. So she pushed around a little cart behind me with the big cart and I had her little sister in the big cart so we could move faster because she walks quite slowly. Um, but she had the little cart. She was grabbing stuff. I had my list on my phone. I was like, okay, we need that. And she would go grab it and put it in her cart. Um, she was excited about picking out all the produce by herself from the shelves anything that she could reach. She was like, oh, let me get it. Like, they love grocery shopping. And even if you don't have the little carts, you can still take them with you and give them some responsibility. Like, hey, here's a list of the things that we need. If they can't read yet, maybe it's like a visual list with pictures, or maybe you just like, I kind of did it, you know, just say, hey, we need that thing. And then let them go get it and put it in the cart, but give them something to do so that they're part of that process of shopping for your family's groceries. They can also cook and prep their own breakfast, lunch, snacks, basically all the easier meals of the day. I feel like at least for us, dinner tends to be a little more complicated. So I would never expect my six to 12 child to cook dinner for the whole family. Definitely help, yes, but not cook dinner for the whole family, at least not yet. Uh, but they are absolutely so good at making their own breakfast in the morning. If it's, as long as you've got all the things within their reach, they know how to work a toaster if you show them how, um, whatever, you know, things they need for their normal breakfast. We have a pantry with things down low since they were little so they can go grab snacks on their own. Again, lunches can be pretty simple and they love to make their own lunch. I would say 95% of the time when I offer to make lunch for my older daughter, she's like, nope, I got it. I wanna make my own lunch. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> more independence around preparing some of their own meals throughout the day 
definitely something to look forward to. And I know somebody's gonna ask it, how do you make sure they're eating things that are healthy? Make sure that's what you have in the house. Don't have tons of junk food and things that you don't want them eating available, and then it won't be there for them to choose. Another one is taking care of a pet. As some of you guys who've been around for a while will know, we used to have dogs. They were very elderly and they passed away almost two years ago now. Uh, we haven't had a pet, but we did get a hamster a couple of months ago that they have loved. And my older daughter loves to keep tabs on how much food and water he has. She's always checking and, you know, oh, he needs more food. They love giving him little treats. She likes to help clean out his little sand bath. So she loves helping to take care of a pet. And I think that's a really good thing to instill is caring for other living creatures. Also money management. So I've talked about this a few times on the YouTube channel that I do give both of my children a very small weekly allowance. Sometimes I forget. <laughs> but anyway, um, they get a weekly allowance usually. And I think that's been really helpful in them learning how to manage their money because my older daughter has recognized that she has spent her money a little more often than her sister has. And her sister now, as a result, has a much greater sum in her piggy bank than my older daughter does. And she was like scratching her head, like, why does she have so much more than me? like the last time we did our allowance and she has now decided, she told me, mommy, I think I'm going to save my money. I'm not gonna spend it because I want to be able to have enough money in my bank if I ever see something that I want that maybe costs a little bit more money. And there was one occasion after she said that, that she almost caved and brought money with her to the store because we were going out for something. And she was like, oh, I think I wanna bring some of my money just in case. And I was like, okay. And then she was like, wait a second. I think I still wanna save my money, like I said before. So never mind, never mind. I'm not gonna bring my money with me. I'm, I'm just gonna save it. And I was like, yes, I'm so excited for her that she's finally like getting, you know, this idea of what it means to save your money and, and save for something as a goal. And then finally, when it comes to increased responsibility with regard to even older children, I'm like, you know, closer to the end of the second plane of development, maybe like nine to 12, that range, I feel like, the likelihood of them having homework is a lot more and the homework load from school might be greater at that age as well. And so it would be really helpful. It's They are capable of sitting down with you and establishing a homework routine, when and where they plan to do their homework each night so that you don't have to be the one kind of overseeing the process and checking it and making sure that they're getting it done. You're, again, ceding the control to them for being responsible for their own homework. And if anything happens, you know, bearing the brunt of those consequences and taking it up with their teacher on their own instead of you constantly being the liaison. Um, another really great book recommendation for you about that um, is The Gift of Failure. Super fantastic book for that older age group. Um, if you haven't read that, add that one to your list too. And then also for older children, obviously they can do more like physically involving like things around the house, like taking out the trash to the curb because they're bigger and they can handle the trash can, um, helping you with yard work or maybe doing some of the yard work tasks on their own after you've shown them how to do it, um, helping to wash or clean out the family car, things like that. Okay, now moving on to the next category of things. And I mentioned this earlier, is this idea of family togetherness that is balancing out that time that your child is spending in independent play. And I think this is so important in the six to 12 age group because they're really starting to figure out who they are. They're starting to go outside of their immediate family circle for their social time. And as a result of that, they're obviously going to be influenced by the things that they're seeing and hearing from other people out in the world and from their friends and what they're seeing happening at their friends' houses if they're going over for, you know, to play. And having this family togetherness, this time to spend together just as a family that is separate from all of that, I think that really helps to keep a child grounded. Um, and obviously this is something that you would start when they're little, but I feel like it's something that shouldn't stop once they start going and playing at their friends' houses and stuff. I think if anything, it's more important that you continue, that that is the expectation that there are these times that we are going to spend time together. And so it's really good 
to have a wide variety of things, experiences that are happening as a family. Um, and so I just have a little list of ideas here for you. Obviously, the first one most people probably think about um, is like a family vacation. And that's all well and good if you have a budget for a family vacation, but it doesn't need to be like this big expensive thing. There are so many things that you can do that are completely free that are even better, I think, sometimes than a family vacation that count as family togetherness time. So some of those things are, for example, a daily walk outside. Maybe you go like after dinner every evening, you know, depending on the season, sometimes it's a little dark, but that could be fun too, going out in the dark for a walk together uh, with flashlights. That's like a different experience for kids, but having a daily walk that you do together, or at least as often as possible, if not daily. Picnics, playtime at the local park. When we have the time as a family on the weekends to go to the park, that is what we do. And they love it. And if you can bring a picnic with you and like have lunch while you're there so that you don't have to leave to go home and get lunch, even better. They could even be involved in helping to pack the picnic for the lunch. Again, that greater responsibility piece. Another one that our family loves is to go on nature hikes together. So you might not live super close to like natural open green spaces where you have the ability to go for a nature hike. It might not be in your backyard, but maybe that could be like a little trip that you take. You know, you find one that's within driving distance or reasonable distance and you make a day trip out of it and you go drive out there, you do your hike and then you drive home. I've done that so many times. Um, it's just, it's great to like get out in a way where you don't have cell phone signal, you know, you're just focused on each other. You're walking, you're talking, you're getting exercise, you're breathing fresh air. It is just, it's one of my favorite ways to spend time as a family. So if you have the ability to do some nature hikes, definitely do them. You could also think in terms of seasons. So like what seasonal activities are available based on our current weather, the current time of year. So just some examples for you. Um, um, in the spring, you can do gardening. We love doing gardening as a family and a six to 12 child is definitely capable of like actually really getting in there and being super helpful when it comes to planting and harvesting and trimming and you know taking things out at the end of the season, things like that. But spring gardening, fantastic one. Also when the weather's nice, a day at the beach or at the lake, if you happen to live near those kinds of bodies of water. I know that was one of my favorite pastimes when I was a child. Pumpkin picking, carving, painting in the fall season, raking leaves, doing yard work together, that kind of thing. And then if you happen to live anywhere like I do, that does get a lot of snow accumulation for part of the year. You can also look into like, what activities can you do outside in the snow that are fun together? You know, simple as building a snowman in your backyard or your front yard, or going sledding, going ice skating. Um, and then of course the holidays happen around those times too. So any holiday traditions that are unique to your family that your child can learn to expect year in and year out. Those are all fantastic opportunities for family togetherness. And then just some other quick, simple ideas, um, having a family movie night, making sure that you play games together either during the day or maybe like on a more formal game night once a week. Um, reading together daily. That is something that is so crucial for your child's language development and just to keep their mind stimulated. And it's just, it's fun bonding time, relaxing bonding time. I love reading with my girls. Um, doing challenging jigsaw puzzles together. As they get bigger, they are capable of doing bigger and bigger puzzles and it gets more fun to do it together as opposed to your child just sitting down and doing it by themselves. So for example, my daughter, she received a 100 piece jigsaw puzzle um, last, I wanna say it was maybe for her birthday last March. So it's been almost a year that she's had it. She is so good at doing the whole thing by herself that she told me the other day, mommy, can we get a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle? I think I need more challenge. But she loves doing them with me, you know, with her dad and together and my and little sister likes to help too. So doing puzzles together could be really fun. And then also baking, cooking together, inviting your child into the kitchen if you're prepping dinner or whatever, getting ready for, you know, maybe you have some company coming over and you're preparing appetizers or something like that. I don't know. But just getting your child in the kitchen and assisting you is another really great way to spend time with them. Now, I know that there are definitely gonna be some families out there who are gonna say, wait a second, I work all the time and I'm basically only home with my children in the evenings and on the weekends. How am I supposed to fit all this stuff in? in the evenings and on the weekends. I'm not saying you have to spend all of your free time, you know, doing all of these things with your children because you need time for you too, but where you can, you know, reasonably thinking about it, where you can fit in something to do with your child in the evening when you've got the energy for it, 
do it. If you have free time on the weekend, you don't have to spend both days doing everything, you know, doing all the things, but maybe pick one day and have that be your family day where you guys do something together, even if it doesn't take up the whole day, but where you've got a designated family activity where you are spending time together. Okay, last category. This is a big one. It is modeling values. In this six to 12 age group, again, they are learning so much about the world and about the way people interact with each other and the way that relationships should look. And it is so important for you to model your values and what you hope for your child to absorb and carry on with them into their own adult lives. So just some things for you to think about. Again, not an exhaustive list. I'm sure you could think of others, but just a couple for you. The first one that came to my mind is a personal goal that I set for myself this year that I'm trying to in involve my family in um, is being more waste conscious. So I'm really looking at uh, the amount of plastic that we are using as a family, um, not only in our food, but in other areas, the bathrooms or toys, um, you know, single use bags at the grocery store, like things like that. And so we are making a concerted effort now as a family to make sure that when we go grocery shopping, we are bringing reusable shopping bags with us instead of getting the, you know, plastic grocery bags that would otherwise just be thrown out. And when we do have to get one of those for some odd reason, uh, you know, somebody forgets or one is just given to us by accident that we are recycling that in the proper store drop-off place so that it isn't just going straight to the landfill. We're also trying to use like the cotton mesh produce bags instead of getting the plastic ones when we are buying our produce. When spring comes, I am super excited to start going back to the farmer's markets because they're closed during the winter time here because it's too cold. We also so make a point of it of recycling everything that does come into our house that is able to be recycled, doing it properly and learning about proper ways to recycle different kinds of materials. We also really like to upcycle some of our recyclable materials for arts and crafts projects and also putting more of an emphasis on the value of experiences as opposed to things. You know, our, our culture is so very consumer driven and that like there's this need to have all the things and I'm trying to help my girls learn that we don't need to have all the things. It's so much better to do something together, to create memories together, as opposed to having to have all the things. And so kind of just focusing on minimalism in general. I mean, I've always been on that train and I'm trying to get my girls to learn a little bit more about it in a way that makes sense for them um, so that they can understand where I'm coming from. And again, hopefully carry that, that on into their own adult lives. And then other ways to model values for your second plane child could be in volunteering opportunities, you know, taking your child on neighborhood, you know, litter trash cleanups, or if you live near a beach, doing a beach cleanup together as a family, um, maybe taking them to a soup kitchen and having them volunteer in a soup kitchen with you, or visiting a nursing home or helping out at a local animal shelter. And obviously some of these things are going to be dependent on how old your child is and what the laws and regulations are and things around around their ability to volunteer in certain places, but exploring what options are available to you as a family and involving your child in that. You can also establish a family culture around donating gently used material goods. So if your child has a toy that they recognize they no longer play with, or they have clothes that they've outgrown and they don't have a younger sibling to pass them on to, donating those things to people who actually need them. And so I actually have a box that sits in my laundry room um, and we fill it up just kind of over the course of weeks or months, however long it takes, but we fill it up until it's full and then we drive it down to our local donation center. And then also donating your money. If you have the budget to donate to charity, to causes that you believe in, that is something that you can also talk to your children about and involve them in. And then finally, for that second plane child, as they are going out into the world a little bit more independently of you, as they are hearing what's going on, you know, outside of the family bubble at home, 
they are naturally going to have questions about some of the things that they hear. And so this is a really great time, if you haven't already, to start talking openly about the things that are going on in your community or in the world at large in an age appropriate way and encouraging them to ask questions so that they feel like you guys are maybe even learning about it together, but that those lines of communication, that dialogue is open for them anytime they are wondering about something. All right, friends. So I think that just about wraps it up for today's video. If you found it helpful, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like more practical tips and advice for implementing Montessori at home with your children, then you might also consider subscribing to my channel. This way you don't miss a new video. My book, The Montessori Home, Create a Space for Your Child to Thrive, is now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon and in all major book retailers. I also have several e-courses, an online community just for Montessori parents where I do live group coaching sessions once a month. And for anyone who is looking for more individualized support, I also offer private coaching sessions. So links to all those resources are in the description box down below. Thank you so much for watching today and I'll see you next time. Bye.